start the session. So Adela Yang is, uh, is the co-founder uh, International Research and Action Alliance for uh, Experimental Higher Education. He is also director and award winner of award-winning documentary. Uh, that's uh, if there is a reason to study. Adela Yang is a responsible world citizen who has devoted his entire adolescence to make a difference in education and youth issues. From the age of 14, he started to run initiatives about youth and education aiming to actualize the cradle of societies where everyone contributes to the collective well-being through conscious self-actualization. At his first professional project, if there is a reason to, to study, uh, that's a documentary that followed uh, five alternative school students' lives for seven years, examining the test-driven education system's impact on students and the risk of alienation with socialization. The film has won awards internationally, influenced uh, education movements in Taiwan, and was lauded the epitome of 2016 Taiwanese movies. And the most important film on Taiwan is education. He is also a supporter, advocate, uh, organizer, or, and participant of several initiatives such as the Design for Change Taiwan Challenge, Alternative Education Organization in New York, uh, Adversity in Hong Kong. He guests, monitors, uh, lectures at uh, National Chung Kung University Education Program in Taiwan and the Adnovator Teacher Fellowship in Hong Kong. He also speaks at several events and today amongst us, uh, he is here. He has also say, given some TED Talks in Taiwan, Taipei TEDx, and he was named to the news uh, lens 2015 30 under 30 list. Am I correct, uh, Adler? Okay. So we have uh, today uh, uh, Adler Yang. He will be talking about yes, Taiwan made alternative education the trend. And what he says in that is that uh, we know that communicating with the public about alternative democratic education is hard, but we also want to show you it's possible. Since 2015, Asia's biggest alternative education campaign, ZA Share, uh, he will be talking more about that, has engaged 1.5 change agents, 200,000 uh, participants, 120 million traffic in this movement. Along with this movement, non-schoolers in Taiwan also uh, has increased by seven folds in the past seven years. Uh, uh, want to know how, where, how were these possible? That's the question. Join us to explore that. He asks us to join him to explore our journey and co-imagine how we might transform the huge community into an ecosystem for educational change. So let's welcome Ta uh, Adler Yang for this wonderful session. Adler Yang, now it's your turn. Thank you very much. Thanks, Veda, and thanks for everyone's participation. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, honestly, this is my first IDEC, although um, it's me who introduced IDEC to Humanity School and um, urged them that they must join IDEC. But as Veda has briefly introduced, that I, I just had too many commi commitments in, in Taiwan and also sometimes in Hong Kong and sometimes in China. And also uh, due to the fact that I have to earn money to support my nonprofit initiatives, I usually don't have the funding to go to IDEX. So it's really a great honor to be here finally uh, with everyone. And so as Vida sh shared, I have several positions and Zashir is one of those positions. I would say that um, main, basically the main, main theme for me is uh, education reform or active, uh, activism and also starting moving towards uh, social philosophy research. And right now at Zashir, my role is the R&D director for learning systems. So basically I got invited to join Zashir this year and uh, my role and my responsibility is to um, work on the question of how might we transform this huge traffic into a more sustained learning ec ecology. So I like to start from, uh, let me 
start sharing the slides. Can you all see the slide? Is it is this being being shared? Yes, it's working. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I'm a graduate of a Taiwanese democratic school called Humanity. And uh, in the past 11 years, I've been working in education activism and also research. So among the work I've done, including some that Vida has introduced, um, I also do a lot of action research. So uh, on the left below picture, it was a 700 student workshop on designing their education. And I, so it is like activism combined with action research. And uh, the story, uh, my encounter with Jia Share happened in 2014. There was a huge movement in Taiwan that was happening, which is the picture on the right upper side. That was the Occupy the Parliament movement. So that year, um, the parliament signed a um, treaty with China about um, some trade issues. However, the, the process wasn't um, transparent enough and the people were very uh, skeptical and cautious about it. And as the, as the treaty was signed without a, um, enough consensus, um, a lot of young people, they went into the parliament and occupied the parliament for two months. It was a huge um, moment in Taiwan as this kind of thing don't happen much in history, of course, but also um, young people at that time uh, many of them start to rethink about what can they do for the society. And a lot of social initiatives um, started to emerge after the movement. And Zashir was one of those. So um, in one, on one day in 2014, I received a mysterious call from an artist called Ozzy, who is the founder of Zashir. So he called me uh, saying that, hi Adler, uh, my name is Ozzy. And he learned about that I've been, um, as a teenager, I've been working on education activism for a quite a long time already. That time, uh, in that year, it was already five years. So he was real, he wanted to also start a movement in education by doing an expo. And he really wanted my um, participation in his work. And I asked why would he like me to join uh, and he said, it's because for so, so long, form has been like dictated, but um, one of those youngsters who really have been researching education and have been um, moving towards educational change for quite amount of time. So he believes that I could be one of those voices that represent the youth voice in education change. So it was a great honor to be invited. And so I wasn't very sure what he was going to do at first because he really was an artist and he really didn't have much idea about what he's going to do yet. But when I really actually met him and I saw these visuals, I was astonished. Um, could anyone tell me that uh, which person is this in these posters? Could anyone tell me? Give a guess. Lao Tzu. Close, close. Confucius? Yes, this is Confucius. So um, he, made, he made these visuals um, having Confucius. So that the basic theme for this visual is if Confucius is reborn in today's society, who will he become? And so it opens a lot of imaginations, as you can see, like becoming a ballet dancer, becoming a doctor or astronaut um, and so on. So 
<clears throat> um, I, I realized that he, he's being serious and he really wanted to like shake some kind of um, common uh, stereotypes about education. Of course, at that time, uh, he wasn't, he, he didn't really, he w didn't really have the capacity to hire me. And I also was co committed to other projects. So we continued to be friends and conversed about a lot of ideas. But uh, at that time, starting from this 2015 Naughty Education Festival, he become <clears throat> one of the leaders in Taiwan education as well. And in the first year, he actually spend um, 250,000 on the expo without earning. And the money comes from his major job, which is a art teacher, but also a professional curator. He has been curating expos and conferences uh, in East Asia, including in Japan, in China, Hong Kong, internationally. The education really was his, really is until, until the day is his calling. So, uh, really ignited by the Occupy the Parliament movement, he decided that I, seeing those young people doing such brave things, uh, he said he also should be brave this time. So he burned those money into this expo and this six year journey. So what was his like, um, there are a lot of, of course, stories related to what brought to his motivation into education, but this is one of his uh, more shared stories. So looking at this picture, I guess most of you can think of what that uh, image is. There's a tree, right? But he, he always re-questioned that, are there any tree that really looks like this in the real world? So from, from this interesting phenomenon, like internationally, uh, it's common to depict tree in this way. However, there's no such tree in the world. So uh, is our imagination being limited by some kind of schooling? That's one of his um, enlightenment moments. And uh, driven by that, despite that he has his curational work um, across different regions, he also felt that it's very important to start doing education. And his beginning point was doing art education. So this is a um, art academy that he ran before Zashir. And uh, look at those pictures that the children draw. Um, these pictures are all trees, but the way he taught these children to draw trees was through drama, was through imagination and through sensation. He gave those cues, for example, like imagine you are such a small seed in th inside the soil. What will the soil feel like? And what does sun, -like feel, sun feel like to you? And how about moisture? And through these like guidance uh, and through these cues, and of course, through actual experience touching the soil and uh, interacting with nature, these children came up with all these fascinating work. Also, uh, he had a class uh, to teach how to draw a line in 24 lessons. So could anyone imagine, like, guess uh, what is the age of those people who drew these pictures? Could anyone give a guess? Is anyone uh, speaking in the chat room? Maybe 10. So these, <clears throat> so these pictures are actually drawn by adults. And um, the way that, why Ozzy had to use 24 lessons to teach drawing a line is because you really have to unlearn so many things in order to really be expressive in art. So for example, uh, the stories I heard was, how do, you use, how do you not use hand and feet to draw a line? And some of those, they, they put 
um, they put their papers on the on the roads and let motorcycles to go over over it, and then they discuss um, what is the essence of line and and so on. It become very philosoph philosophical, and people start to question like Ozzy, why you're so crazy? You already have um, such a good say curator internationally, but why do you do these? And people are not buying in. But of course, he used this like monetary example showing them that these are actually valuable. For example, um, as you can see, these pictures are like the epitomes of modern art, according to him. I'm not an artist, but by these expressions, they have monetary value. Of course, Ozzy uh, was aiming more than that. He really wants to, wants to break through the stereotypes of education through his profession art. But he, see, he saw the limitations in teaching art. So he decided to use curation and art into education reform. So in 2015, uh, with the beginning of Nadi Education Festival, which is um, the festival bef before Zasher, he, he made this promotional video. So this promotional, uh, what's in your bag, um, actually is challenging like the notion in traditional education that uh, what is delinquency? And as you can see in the video that as the, if you have things that doesn't belong to school, it shouldn't be there. However, um, using this promotional, he really pointed out that uh, isn't this, this tradition in school confining the talents of so many children? And he invited a lot of art creation, as you can see here, like having those uh, people doing different professions to take a picture of uh, what they had in their school bag. And that, um, starting from that, uh, Zashir, eventually until now grew into a huge campaign and also a social enterprise that has engaged this much people. And today I like to share as a friend and also as a researcher uh, from an activist perspective or social reform perspective to see how he actually drove this movement. So we can first look at these video view counts. These are a thousand views on Facebook, and we will look from these videos to see some common elements that drove, uh, that drove such attraction and impact. So first, um, I think a key question that um, emerges from these videos is how might we make people re resonate? Um, one thing I see that is important in Zashir's experience is instead of preaching a solution, for example, like saying what is right or what should education be, he really always tried to find and point out the shared pain, what the shared pain is, uh, how are people dissatisfied or feeling painful in the education experience. So one of the uh, hugest pain uh, that resonates a lot in Taiwan is that people 
um, because of a um, very test-driven education culture. Many people didn't have the opportunity to explore who they want to become, and therefore they struggle with what they really want to do. As you can see here, this is a survey uh, conducted by a magazine called Commonwealth, which is one of, one of the leading magazines like um, The Economist in Taiwan. So they did, did this research and found that students are really struggling about what they want to do. And in fact, there are also other research that shows similar results, but that will be another, there, that will be another talk. So addressing this common uh, pain, here is one of the videos that Dasher made in its second year. <laughs> So as you can see that um, this video directly addresses the confusion or uh, the sense of feeling lost by the young people and really got huge attraction. And as you can see, um, it got um, 486, more than 486,000 views on Facebook. Um, and the other, the other video here, it's not translated into English, so, but I'll give, give it a um, briefly introduce what it's about, but you can uh, still experience how they communicate this message. So basically this video is a multiple choice test and also a essay, an essay test. Uh, the essay test is about what I want to become in the future. And the multiple, choi multiple choice test is about what are the occupations I want to do in the future. And, um, and this character is very anxious about um, making this choice is going to determine his life for so long. There will be a clock above that is actually showing years, not, not hours. And when he finally decided which option he's going to do, he then realized that, oh, there are other options. Why didn't I know that? Mm, and then um, there is a parallel, parallel um, character of him um, showing different features. So we can take a look at the how the how Zasher communicates this message. What did I write? I don't know why. Oh, sorry. Maybe maybe I can um, mute. Is it is it possible that I? translate the like translate by speaking can you hear my translation when i play a video yeah yeah sure yeah okay i'll try uh oh what did i write i can't remember i want to be a b c d well, just choose. Life is a multiple choice. When I choose, it will be more than the result will be affecting me more than decades. 
As I grow up, there are more options. Nobody tells us what's the correct answer. Are there other options? What is that? How about this? What is it? How did they find these options? Maybe. I want to become in this time. The left. Yeah. So the in the final scene, the left、uh, left him was the one that followed the、um, multiple multiple choice test, and the right one is the one who drew that imaginative picture on his essay piece. So <clears throat>、um, that was the first lesson that I learned from Zashir, and the second is that. How, how how might we resonate? We might resonate by bringing novel experience to highly relatable elements. So one of the as you as you saw already that、uh, the first year Ozzy used Confucius as a symbol to communicate because everyone knows that Confucius is related to education. But、um, by decorating or depicting Confucius differently, it is showing a strong message that. He is trying to do something different about education, and this one is the next, the second year's、uh, main symbol of, or the main theme of the expo.、Uh, the main theme of it is Nejia. Nejia is a、uh, teenage god in Chinese、um, Chinese religion. So a brief history,、uh, a brief story about this god is that、um, he was a son of. To God, to God and goddess, and but during his teenage age, he was also pretty delinquent, as you can see when he was moved,、uh, theatric, theatricized.、Uh, that was him like peeing,、uh, but so he was like playing around and being pretty pre、uh, delinquent. However, there is once that he accidentally killed、um, one of the other gods' son. So,、um, the his father and mother was in trouble, and then Naja said that, "Dad, I will repay. I will repay with my life. You don't need to be involved." As you can see in the、uh, left lower picture, and he killed himself and returned his flesh to his parents. So this story、um, is is about delinquency. In Chinese mythology, and he then become one of the gods in、um, Chinese culture and also Taiwan, especially in Taiwanese culture.、Um, this you you can see on the left upper side that that is the god costume、uh, traveling around the world because it's a huge important symbol that represents kind of like Taiwanese ethos. Maybe it's a little bit political, but maybe, maybe referring to Chinese Taiwanese relationship, the 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 fact that、um, Taiwan want to kind of like cut the ties with their parents and let's return the flesh back to its parents and、uh, no longer want to get involved or、um, like being tied together. So、um, in that year. Zasher did this video. So as you can see, that 
uh, Zasher used mythology in and translated into modern um, presentation that Nunja becomes a modern kid. And actually there was a poem written for that purpose. Every child is Nunja brought to the world by love with three heads, nine eyes and eight arms made mom and dad's life a living hell exhausted from happiness. But the world is too heavy made Najah's back too heavy. Put the fire wheels in a toolbox. The fire wheels is um, the, via the vehicle that Najah rides. Minor exams are ghosts, major exams demons. Cram schools undefeatable by his fire spear. The fire spear is his weapon. Obediently, little Najah shrunk, shrunk his three heads and eight arms, concentrated on one thing. 12 years in uniform, no choice but become ordinary. Naja is tied, spiritual eye blindfolded. What, what it means by spiritual eye is in Eastern mythology that some God, they have a spiritual eye. Also in Indian mythology, I believe, you can see things that are spiritual or maybe like to the heavens or to the hell. Spiritual eye blindfolded, could no longer fly but stumble, could no longer recognize, recognize his own face, no longer make his own voice. Dad and mom, Naja wants a farewell to give back his bloated body, dismantle his skeletons of rules. Please let Naja fly. Let him be full of possibilities. Let him see himself. And one day he will share, share with you the miracle that he will eventually become. Yeah, so the last part is referring to that he eventually also became a god by self-sacrificing and also of course a long long journey so so con using confucius and also naja these cultural symbols um zasher uh touches what what the people have already been familiar with with a novel perspective and also through a very touching modern interpretation interpretation. And also, so after attracting these people, um, when they come to Zasher or participate in Zasher, how might, how might Zasher make people feel welcome? And of course, how might we learn from this experience? First, um, I think it's pretty straightforward, which is make it fun and playful. You can take a look at this video, which is Zosh share in 2017. <laughs> So um, as an artist and also curator, he knows that the experience of the participants are very important. And also um, having fun and interactive and playful experience is very important to lowering the threshold or the barrier for people to join. So there are many interactive uh, experience as long as, so, so many, Many exhibitors at Zasher, they don't do like traditional education, of course, but they're also not, not limited to educators. Many of them, for example, magicians, they came, and also artists, they came, as long as their work is designated to um, cherishing diversity and cherishing humanness, because Ozzy believes that with diversity, as long as people are different, there is something to learn from each other, which is also derived from Confucius. And also uh, by treating person, persons as person, which is, mean, which is to treat people humanely, uh, you are doing like the essence of education, which is what Ozzy believes. So uh, the exhibitors are not limited to educators, uh, neither in the traditional sense or in the alternative sense. Um, 
and also provided very uh, accommodating environment, for example, for disabilities and for, um, for example, you, you can see a child, um, a child resting in that area and a mom <laughs> resting in that area. And also, um, Zashir, as, as Ozzy is a professional curator, he coaches many of the exhibitors how to present their work into a better experience design. So these are all like um, the exhibitors being coached by Ozzy and also by other Zashir colleagues. And this is what they present. As you can see, it's very aesthetic and also uh, visually and um, also physically engaging. But what I think is probably not less important, if not more important, is to be tolerant and focus on the commons. By saying the commons is by sharing, by focusing what people share, despite of the difference, which in by saying difference, it might be like um, different stances. So um, also deriving from Confucianism, Confucius has said, the human, the humane men seek harmony, but not uniformity. The little men seek uniformity, but not harmony. Um, he does not, he does not limit, as I, as I already said, not limit to educators, but also even if you come together, it's okay to be on the, on different positions on the same spectrum. It could be, you can have very different positions or very different stances, but as long as you share that dissatisfaction, as long as you share that um, cherish to diversity and humane humanity, you are welcome to this environment, even if your proposed solution are against each other. So uh, here you can see many invited um, speakers. They are not traditional educators, of course, but sometimes they also help, help different stances. Um, but by bringing them together, conversation happens. Um, and also um, by bringing different people from different stances, it brings a lot of people because they already have their original crowd and bringing them brings their crowd. So as you can see, Zashir during the expo, it feels like a Disneyland for education. People lining up for tickets, they actually have to buy, but of course the ticket is very, very cheap. It's around um, $10, uh, 15, no, no, not $15, like $12 US dollars. Let's see, people uh, lining up. And this one is probably very uh, noteworthy, which is these are the people lining up to visit, to, to tour the alternative education pavilion. Uh, it's called experimental education because it, the law calls it in Taiwan. But as you can see from these sharings that I just, I just mentioned that um, although these people originally, they might not know about alternative education, but they share, the shame, they share the similar pains in the education system. They're dissatisfied and they want to look for different, so they want to look for solutions. And naturally they being engaged by the messages uh, targeting their pains and coming to the expo uh, with this pavilion designated to alternative education, they're naturally drawn to this pavilion without um, how should I put it? Like without um, mm, like specific effort because it just happens naturally. So with this huge attraction and with this huge traffic, how might we translate popularity into impact? This is also something that Zashir has been working on. So as I mentioned, Zashir has already a huge base, um, which could, we could thank to its artistic its expressions and all those elements that I just shared. Um, and as these, 
as Zasha become popular, it also went around the world to share experiences. And because, because all these people who come to Zasha are voters or they, they represent votes. So politicians also come. As you can see here on the right-hand side, it is the Minister of Education, which is basically like the head of Department of Education equivalent to US. Um, regardless who is the Minister of Education, they will al always come every year to Zaxia. And this is the Vice President of Taiwan um, coming to Zaxia. And different, the political leaders of different parties, they also come to Zaxia because they want voters. And of course they want to know what their voters are thinking. So with this, it creates a political leverage. And this is one of the cases that Zaxia used, used it, its political leverage. This organization originally was a group of college students. Um, they grouped together, believing that the Taiwanese textbook is too lousy. <laughs> it's too, um, it's too anti aesthetic and very unengaging. This is the ordinary textbook that you can see. So it's designed like this. And as the students are getting very bored, uh, listening to the classes and very disengaged with the course materials, um, many of them express their creativity through these means, as you can see, see here. So they believe that um, if we do a minor change in textbooks, making them more engaging and add some elements to make it more explorative and learning directed, it could create a huge impact. So Zasher, uh, seeing this exhibitor in the expo, he connected these college students and brought them to the government and started to, it's not really lobbying, but um, start to share their stories. And the government also senses that, oh, so there actually is such need in education. So as you can see, many of those older peoples are government officials here and Ozzy in the middle. So they listened to this and the government people brought the textbook companies to join this conversation. And eventually several different textbook publishers lay adopted the design by these college students and their textbooks are being spread around the country already. For example, as you can see, they integrate AR technology to make uh, their textbook more interactive or make it um, physically interactive. And also with some, some designs make the, uh, make the interaction with the textbook more in accordance to multiple, multiple intelligence. The other uh, example that I can share, which mo more people could relate with, was AP Tech uh, in 2016. So AP Tech 2016 was hosted by a graduate by oh, graduate of holistic school, but he didn't really have those resources and government relationships. So um, Zasher helped to make this um, visual design basically helped the visual design of the whole conference and also helped connect uh, the organizing committee with those key persons and facilitate, facilitated AP Deck to happen, App Deck to happen in 2016. And also Zasher will be supporting 2023 IDEC in Taiwan as well. So with all these efforts, um, experimental or term education has become the trend in Taiwan. Of course, I, we, cannot, we cannot say that all of these are done by Zashir, but Zashir has contributed a lot to that. Here are some statistics in Taiwan. So the Experimental Education Act was passed in 2014. By saying experimental education, uh, some of you might already know, but some of you might have not. So I'll give a brief introduction to it. 
Um, by saying experimental education, it means that individuals, groups, or institutions, or schools uh, practicing experimental education could opt out uh, traditional school regulations or national curriculum, as long as you provide a learner-centered proposal to the uh, to a democratic committee, which is formed by educators and also uh, experimental education parents. So uh, since it, its approval in 2014, experimental education has been uh, growing rapidly. So this is the this is the total um, total number for experimental education, and this this one is a non school non school experimental ed education. By saying non school, it includes personal, group based, or institution based, which is which means like basically like group homeschooling or uh, free school that is not registered at school or homeschoolers or unschoolers. So uh, they also increase by sevenfold. And of course, there are a lot of grassroots who have been working on the policy reform, uh, which I was also a little bit, um, I also participated a bit in those. But Sashir is like the public relationship side for that reform, basically introducing and spreading the idea and and engaging more people into this movement. So having all the, like accumulating this impact, what does Zashir want to do in the future? Um, Ozzy wants, Ozzy and I has this vision of creating a lifelong learning innovation ecosystem, but he, his expertise really is in um, art and curation. So he invited me to join as the R&D director this year officially to help develop this system. And um, my basic problematic of developing the system is based on the idea of allocation dependence, which is a um, topic that I written in my paper. So my, my idea is, is this, that I see the traditional schooling process uh, analogous to the environmental destruction in what way, which is you see that the competition, the, um, the competition for educational resources, the consumption of education resources, the exhaustion of education resources, and the waste of education resources, that linear process is very analogous to the process of destroying our environment, which we exploit resources, we distribute resources, we compete for resources, we occupy resources, and then we consume and waste unused resources. There is no in, like inbuilt regenerative um, circulation or system into our daily behavior, nor has such resource regeneration process being inbuilt in our education process. So um, even if we teach sustainability, even if we teach ecology, that is not going to change because the way the system, the, the way the system operates is not changing. So this is like my basic uh, thesis about allocation dependence, and it could be another talk. And my initial, my it, initial directions in addressing that comes a lot from, uh, of course, democratic education and some Eastern traditions. Um, learning by contributing. The basic idea is a circular, is a circular regenerative process. But I could I could talk about that if you if you have more questions into that. And the to use a common language, I would say is to make the spirit of progressive and critical pedagogy into a new attitude and style of living by turning problems into learning materials and by turning the world into sandboxes of hope. However, as we all encountered, COVID-19 hit the world just um, so incredibly. And Zasher, um, as I mentioned, um, while Ozzy has been working on Zasher for six years, 
um, the main financial support for Zashir is his curation company. So every year he uses the money from his curation company to support Zashir. However, because of COVID-19, there could be no, uh, most of the curational projects were just canceled. So no income this year. And to overcome this crisis, we collaborated with the National Development Council and received their funding to address several issues. But of course, by, address, by receiving government funding, there are a trade-off, which is that we have to follow their agenda. So this is probably the uh, last, but also uh, re relevant issue that a lot of us might have faced, which is how might we live with the funders' expectations and work with budget constraints without losing our souls. So um, here are the two major issues that um, Zashe promised the government to address. One is regional revitalization. The challenge, uh, which is also share, uh, shared among many countries, ma marginalization of rural regions, skip generation families, employment in rural regions. And also, despite there has been efforts of revitalizing the regions, um, bringing um, the economic revitalization. However, many of them are very unsustainable. You might have hosted a ex an expo at the rural region, but after the expo, the rural region becomes the same. However, there are some successful insights from education. So in Taiwan, um, many families, they move to rural regions for alternative schools. Humanity School is one of them, Waller School is another. And so we see that people are willing to go to rural regions because of education. So uh, our current direction, which will, which will be a program launched in our next year, um, is to help existing small and middle enterprises and nonprofits to develop learner-centered and holistic educational products and services. And by based on that, we facilitate collaborative effort among educators, SMEs, and nonprofits to develop place-based place learning and programs. And we also bridge schools into the developed learning opportunities, basically like bringing students into these learning programs. And we aim to make rural regions and communities the best play or exploration based and learners through campuses instead of like being, being stuck in the traditional campus. The other direction is digi digital transformation. And uh, from a perspective, my personal perspective, I see this pretty arbitrary. The, 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 the government has to cope with the global competition, digital literacy, and also the digitization of societal infrastructures require uh, behavioral changes, et cetera. Um, but of course, there are some positives of that. So um, I looked into the successful insights, including Wikicity, Wikicity Amsterdam. It was a project that using the idea of Wiki, which is uh, co-creation, co-learning, co-editing into envisioning Amsterdam's 2030 city vision. And there were many efforts, including like Legos in the common areas, and also a lot of workshops and meetings hosted or um, designated for the citizens. And together they did really make, they did really make a 2030 vision for Amsterdam. And a lot of uh, new initiatives uh, arose from that campaign. Open Ideal is another case, which is, so Open Ideal is a website hosted by the design firm Ideal. And the idea of Ideal is, Open Ideal is that they, they raise um, challenges posted by many stakeholders working towards social good, but they need the intelligence and also um, the um, collaboration by the citizens. So the citizens go to the website 
and to look into the challenges and through design thinking process, they ideate and come up prototypes that could possibly address those issues raised by the <clears throat> raised by the organizations. And they provide that platform to match these solutions and needs. Reflexive media is uh, a huge part of my reaction research in the past years. So by saying reflexive media, uh, I'm, I actually have this uh, premise that the traditional media is very one directional, uh, which is also very analogous to a traditional education or classroom experience. So basically all the knowledge generation or content generation happens in the black box and the consumer or audience could only passively decide whether they're going to consume this content or not. But reflexive media basically brings in inquiry-based learning and other democratic or learner-centered approach, which is to have the learners or the audiences to generate um, the needs or generate the directions for the media. So basically what are their needs? And from those needs, they together go through an explorative, explorative um, journey and together produce the content. So here are some pictures of one of our cases. Um, the, this girl is called Lydia. Um, she's born in a single family, low income, low income, uh, si single parent, low income family. Um, she did pretty well in school, but when her grandma, grandma got into a car accident, she had to leave school to take care of her grandma, grandma because they didn't have other financial support to have other solutions. But eventually she found that, oh, actually, uh, homeschooling is more effective and efficient than traditional schooling. However, his father uh, was thinking that he should probably go back to school and take tests to go to college and get your degree. Of course, Taiwan tuition is way lower than America's. For example, it could cost like only it would cost like one thousand, one thousand dollar per year to two thousand dollar per year. However, it, it, it's still pretty high to Lydia, and Lydia likes to learn. However, she didn't really see the point of going to college, and he she was worried that whether spending that tuition will be a waste. So she came up with this need that she wants to know whether college degree is necessary for uh, employment. And then she embarked a journey with us to do research on this topic and also interviewed um, these career leaders or industry leaders, some of those without college degree. And eventually he came, she came up with a, an issue of our magazine and gave it back to his dad saying that, dad, I did these research and these employers, these experts told me that it's not necessary to go to college immediately or at, even at all. So with that, um, she and us, we prevented a potential conflict that could happen between the parent and her. And eventually her dad was more convinced and were able to let her go on her own way. Because of her passion in education, she started as a kindergarten teacher and eventually become, became one of the leaders of experimental education initiatives. And as she started, as she worked for several years and also became an administrator in a um, experimental, basically a free, a primary free school, she, she felt that it's about time to learn about theory. So she used her portfolio without taking the college entrance exam and got accepted by 
the so-called top universities in Taiwan and also received the presidential award and many other real awards. And, and on the bottom right, you can see her uh, delivering speeches around the country. So that is one of the cases uh, in our action research. And we aim that by, by uh, implementing this model at Zashir, we want to create a digital platform so for societal democratic learning and collective intelligence. Of course, this is our aim, and we, we are aiming to launch this also from, from January, and we will also have interna international engagement, and we look forward to have you as well. And this is the immediate event that's going to happen, which is also part of the digital transformation. So my colleagues now upstairs of this studio, they're working very hard for the upcoming expo, which is going to be entirely online. Although at this moment in Taiwan, it's not necessary to host um, an expo online already. Um, events are, physical events are everywhere because COVID-19 is really, rather uh, pretty well managed in Taiwan. But Zash, uh, I mean, Ozzy, he really wants to challenge and unlearn many things. So he decided that this year we're going to put the expo entirely online. The expo online will be a game, and here are some visuals of the prototype of the game that if you come, you will see. <clears throat> you will, it will be a role play game. But besides of the role play game, there will also be other programs for people to, to host or to join. For example, this is a tutorial. You can record videos to teach people anything. And also there will be press conferences, of course, having government uh, politicians to come or other key influencers and to, mer to continue doing that um, bridge making among the academia, the industry and government that Zosir has been doing for years. And also there will be a lot of uh, talk shows happening on the main channel and also uh, real life shows going to uh, bringing people to do a lot of location-based learning, which is also kind of like promoting the idea that rural places could be very good campuses for children. And there will also be live physical events that's live streamed. It will be a pity that you cannot join us physically, but of course you will see the live stream and it will be translated into English, including uh, debates about some sensitive topics like is it necessary to attend college, commit suicide, and how should we think about one night stands and so on. So basically you can see the way that Ozzy designs these topics. It really attracts like young people. And Zosher salons are for exhibitors to present themselves, to engage people. And of course, we also have open spaces, which a lot of you, if you are interested, you can come. We already have Agile Learning Center, North Star, Design for Change, Free Space, Mindelay from Korea, and more people hosting open spaces. And I will be hosting a symposium uh, that kind of underlies the idea that I just shared about allocation dependence which is about shifting from the effectiveness and efficiency paradigm into a resili resilience and robustness paradigm in education. As we can see that in, during COVID-19, the original, um, the global network that is based on the premise of interna internationalization and also global, um, the global, um, um, yeah, basically like the, I forgot the, the, the exact term for it, but like <clears throat> um, the, the having different, having American industry, um, having American um, designs being produced in China or India and so on. And once that, once that link, once that link for effectiveness and efficiency is broken, now we see the situation we face today. And I think it is time for us to rethink about more uh, sustainable 
and self-reliant, self-sufficient, more global approaches to, to our society. And we will think, think towards that direction from the perspective of education. So we will have two themes, two topics under this symposium. So I guess the last question uh, I'll leave for our discussion is from all these that I shared and also from so many things that you have shared and you can share, how might we work together and learn from each other globally? And we really look forward for further collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elder. Now, will you be available for question and answer now? Sure. Okay, sure. Let's let's start. Yes, Derry. You're, you are muted. You didn't hear what I was saying under my breath. Yeah, while everyone's getting their questions together, I'd just like to make a comment of uh, appreciation for Adler's presentation. Absolutely fascinating and wonderful, but it's filled me with a terrible sense of embarrassment. And I'll tell you why. I was invited by way to give a talk at the Holistic School in Taipei a couple of weeks ago, which was lovely and I did it. And, uh, but I'm just so embarrassed that I knew nothing about the work of Zarsher. And I really should have said, look, look, um, don't ask me to do this talk for heaven's sake. Ask Adley Yang, he's got much more to say than I have. So. I, I think I'd better send a little e email to, to Wei at the uh, Holistic School <laughs> and, uh, and apologize for my ignorance um, with hindsight. <laughs> no, no, Gary, you're too uh, humble. You provided very valuable lessons to all of us. And I'm also good friends with the Holistic School, so they also know me. So, yeah, we always exchange ideas as well. <clears throat> And I ask you and how about the notion of cooperation? It was brilliant to see that. And, uh, really jealous about not having someone like that in in our country um, uh, to do something like our share, which looks fantastic. Um, in our small way, we've got a little bit of funding to have a festival of learning in our own city, um, and not a festival of education, of course. The notion being that it would be helping people to understand because many people are put off the notion of learning through the, their experiences in school and how do we work with local communities and we're located in, in a quite a deprived area where where most people have not been to college or university um so i'm just wondering how we could collaborate i mean we, i would love to get just connected in what we're but um um it's because we the person who's fronting that um our festival of learning actually is interested in a more international dimension and has just been in Spain recently creating some of those contacts. So, so we have a, a notion of connecting, but it's, yeah, I mean, my interest is this is a global movement. I mean, and, and we need mutually to support each other. So I'm kind of interested in what your ideas might be in, in any kind of sharing. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think, um, of course, You'll be more than welcome to join the upcoming expo. Although there are so many unlearning and learnings happening right now, and um, our colleagues upstairs are on fire <laughs> um, because there's like go going online is just it, like very different from having it physical. But everyone's everyone's learning, and so that's one. Uh, so maybe you can come host some host some open spaces at the expo and to meet people there. And of course, um, next year, our, our um, media program will also be international. We will, 
as I, as I mentioned that the basic idea will be uh, having um, currently, we'll probably have starting from Taiwan, but eventually want it to be more internationally inclusive to so have uh, young people um, coming up with their questions and their needs and through that explorative journey and also invite international professional uh, comments and together generate content. And that will happen in the form of conferences and also the, the discussions happening at the conferences will also be generated into video and text um, into articles. So um, those are also some possible um, possible places or opportunities for for participation or collaboration in the near future. And of course, as I as I mentioned, Sashir will be one of the main collaborators of IDEC 2023. So of course, when you come to Taiwan at the time, hopefully. Um, we can interact more. Yes, David. Oh, I'll always feel the silence. <laughs> um, yeah, there's an organization of young people in England which is growing very fast, um, isn't it has the ear of some politicians, but not enough. Um, it grew out of the um, student strike, the school strike movement, inspired by Greta Thunberg from Sweden. The organization is called Teach the Future. And they're mm. demanding, uh, very politely, but they are demanding curriculum change in our mainstream school system in order to deal adequately with the issues coming out of climate change. And they've already realized that they must move beyond climate change to social inequalities. Um, yeah, exactly. And I think they would love to be linked to your organization, though they don't come yeah, from any kind of official body. It's entirely generated by the young people themselves. So I would like yeah. to put them in touch with you if that's okay, and for them to make a contribution perhaps to your expo. And just before I finish, Adler, I came late to your talk. Who is Ozzy? Is it a person or okay. is it a character yeah, in yeah, yeah. a cartoon or what? <laughs> Thank you. Not the Ozzy, not Ozzy the wizard, but um, but so he, he is the founder of Zashir and uh, we have been friends before he started he started Zashir and he officially invited me to Zashir this year to kind of help him kind of deepen what he wants to do. And also, as I mentioned, to kind of transform this traffic into a more sustained, um, like longstanding programs and ecosystems. Yeah, because before, before this, Zashir is basically a, an annual expo. And, there, and other than the expo, Z Ozzy had to kind of work on his curational work to kind of earn money to support Sasha. <laughs> so he's a real person. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, he's a real person. Yeah. Uh, actually, Derry, he was supposed to be here with us, but because uh, yeah. the schedule, schedule changed uh, from our side, so he was not able, but hopefully he will be there the next time, you know, when the IDEC happens in Nepal. Great. Yeah. Adria. Uh, yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I can see you. Yet, okay. So. Can see me. Okay. I turned on the camera, but I am. Uh, I have to get to an appointment, unfortunately, uh, and I am on the road, so to say. So maybe the mobile data is not so good. Um. I wanted to ask you if you have some hands-on examples on how you tried to adapt the existing curriculum because I am a teacher and unfortunately where I live most most of the schools are rather conservative uh, and I've 
been in very free schools and I enjoy it and I think there's so much value in it. Um, and I'm always trying to find ways on how to help the students find themselves, express themselves, know themselves. Um, yeah, so if you have some more ideas on, on that, I would be very happy to hear. I see. So concerning curriculum, also Derry mentioned about that a little bit. So actually after years of collected graph, grassroots effort, uh, Taiwan has now uh, mandated that the board for the national curriculum must include students. So there are students on the board that is collectively making decisions about the national curriculum in Taiwan, but it, it, took, wow. it took quite a long, long time. Did someone ask something? No, I, I just said, wow, because that's quite an uh, achievement. Okay, yeah, yeah. So uh, that will that will be another like long talk, and probably some other Taiwanese people who are directly involved will be better speaker than me. Um, but in terms of like curriculum or like in the classroom, um, I I would say that. Um, from my experience, um, many students, at least for me, like in Taiwan, many students, they, they, their immediate needs are not like uh, having the curriculum or having the classes more interactive or more playful. Their immediate needs are like, um, Oh, that girl looks so cute. I want to date her. Or like, um, yes. <laughs> or like, um, what's the most uh, trendy movie going on? Or m maybe not movie. Right now, it's it's uh, Netflix already. Netflix series. <laughs> and uh, what's what's going on with the latest mobile game? So, um, so even like sometimes in Taiwan. Uh, change like curric curricular changes are already happening in classrooms, but um, the students are still disengaged because of th those reasons. I guess like from many democratic schools, uh, including humanity, that at, because the curriculum comes from the students' needs, so many of their direct like immediate needs could be transform into project learning, for example, like let's talk about love and about love. You can you can talk about that from multiple dimensions like biology, psychology, and, and so on. And like um, some some students, not in humanity, but it's a it's a uh, probable and actually imp actually implemented curriculum in some some school, which is that Students are unsatisfied about their uh, school uniforms, and uh, a teacher took the initiative using Design for Change to um, facilitate the students to go through a process of uh, reforming the school re uniform. So the students through that project learn about aesthetics, learn about pro like collaborative learning, and also learn about democratic process and so on. So I think it it if there is this space to kind of align curriculum with the students like emotional states or their immediate needs or desires it might be a way to kind of address your question i just don't know whether there's this this kind of like uh, flexibility because it really depends on which school you're in. In some schools in Taiwan, neither could they do this. They could only probably do it during club time or other times. Thank you. It's it's a nice direction where I can look for ideas. I find that I have to be very very creative. But um, your talk was so inspiring. It gives me hope. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, I have a question, Adler. How frequent is your interaction with uh, schools? How do you connect with the schools? Okay, so um, I had more interaction with schools before 2016 because I, I was more regularly invited to schools to host workshops either for the school administrators for parents, for students, or for teachers. Uh, so through those workshops, I, I was able to like, um, yeah, I think like those workshops themselves are also important uh, components of my action research and really getting to know what's happening at the frontier. Uh, but after 2016, I actually uh, left Taiwan and along a huge part of that, I've been in Japan with Kageki. <laughs> Um, doing more, more like hard research. So um, after 2016, I've been less like directly involved in schools, but more into like um, theoretical research. And also some, I also did a research um, on a American um, higher institution, which is pretty elitist, pretty elitist. Uh, I don't want to name it yet. And I don't know whether I can publish it because it's so controversial. <laughs> it's, it's, it's another long story. But I, so in terms of Taiwan schools, my main involvement continues until like 2016. Occasionally the day I still get inv invited to schools, but right now my main focus uh, are in, one is Sasha, uh, which is as you can, you can imagine it's more like social learning if you define it in a traditional sense. And, and uh, the other one is higher education. Uh, as you introduced me, I, I'm now working on some policy research and reform on higher education as well. And the other is to <clears throat> do system thinking education which I got a certificate from Cornell and now working with some professors to develop course curriculums that are more learner-centered uh, and integrating system thinking. And of course, democratic education. I'm now translating Yakov, Yakov's book into Chinese. Yeah, so um, yeah, I hope this answers your question. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes, Cecilia. Um, Adler, it was lovely to um, hear what you've been doing over the last few years, and uh, I really, really treasure the um, the creativity and fun that Sasha is trying to bring to this whole process. Um, so I hope that that can really grow and develop. Um, and like Ian and, and Derry, uh, I just wanted to check with you that you knew about the Summerhill Festival next year. And yeah, would definitely. you be interested in the Tsar Chair being part of that? Because I'm sure they would love to have something like that as, um, you know, as part of that whole experience, whether it's online or in person or whatever. Yeah, definitely. I actually has been exchanging and kind of like nudging, nudging Ozzy towards that direction. And he also came up with the idea of um, if, if there is this opportunity to work with Summerhill, he could probably like mobilize his resources in, in like um, expo curation to make it like a, if, if, if COVID-19 like um, got resolved, um, it could be possible to have a like Summerhill expo touring around the world. Yeah, uh, great idea. He came up yeah came up with this idea and he's more than enthusiastic to be involved because like Summerhill is like everyone's like legend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that would be great, yeah. Yeah, that's a great idea. Any more questions? Do we have any more questions, comments? I just wanted to say that I like very much the idea of a, 
uh, improving the schools out of town. And because I'm involved in education, in rural education in India, and I thought our schools today, uh, I hear a lot of speak, people speak here, and I uh, attend quite a lot lately uh, of conferences around the world. And I can see that our, we are only 20% uh, democratic, I can say, or going towards it. A lot of peer learning happening. But I think that our school, actually, we can, uh, at the moment, is for poor rural children. Uh, but I see in the future, uh, this, this could actually turn to be a better education, that people who work online anyway, they can move to have a better quality of life and much better education. Uh, our schools are big, with gardens, with this and that. So I can really like, uh, yeah. Yeah, I would like to, to think about it more and see how to, to to, in, in, to, I don't know, to make to bring the awareness or to, to make the movement because if we know that we have people coming in then we can it will be enhancing more our movement because we can see there is a future income also because you see all yeah, the schools yeah. that spoke most of the schools that I heard until now speaking in this conference it's mostly rich uh, people spoke about projects of 400 one thousand dollar project per one project our students cost, I mean, it's about uh, to fund that more, we have 5,600 people that are children, students that are 100% funded. It's about $300 a year to have one uh, transportation, clothes, food, and education. So uh, we are working on minimum budget. And uh, you see people who talk about $400, 1000 only $1,000 project, for, uh, five children, Eight year old, they did the project. I mean, this is all sounds not normal to me, and I don't see how how we can go to. I don't see the combination like the, it sounds like democratic education is very expensive. So you can do it, and it's also for people who don't have any ob see obligation. If you deal with poor people, uh, about sixty percent the parents had informal education. I'd call, I don't want to say they are not educated because they learned to be a carpenter or farmer at the time. That was the type of education that they got in the village. But they didn't know, most of them, like 60 or 63, I think, don't know how to read and write and all of that. So the, our students today, they are actually the connection between the family and the establishment, because the establishment became very sophisticated and they take advantage of the situation of the parents. So today our students learn economy and all kinds of things. And they are the ones who go to the bank at 14 to protect the family. So they can, we cannot uh, allow them not to have all kinds of basic knowledge. And also they need to do the government test because otherwise they won't get a job which they need or go to college or whatever. So we have to play like we, I call it, they have to pay the tax to society by doing the government tax which we try to make it as fast as possible and leave time for education, for real education. So at the moment, it's really, I wish we could do it more and I wish we could combine. But may, maybe making it, a, a, bringing up the, 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 the type of payment, uh, we get people like uh, who move with a good job and move to the village. So we can get, a, we can A, improve, increase our democratic side and have more money because basically democratic means more money. And the, the way I see that everybody here who talked, talked about cost. Everything is costly. I mean, we cannot afford, we have a garden because the children do the garden. We do a lot of an, uh, involvement in the society, all kinds of projects because if the children go out, the students go and do projects in the villages, hygiene, we teach hygiene in the villages. We do all of that because it's cheap. Anything that we need to do, we grow, uh, we plant trees all over the area because we grow them from seed. We have the garden because the, ch the children grow the food. We have kitchens. So all of this is what we do is because, so maybe uh, there was somebody who wrote many years ago a book that it's good to grow as a poor child. I forgot the name, I think Boki's name is. It was a book from the, 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 the late 1900s, I think Boki. And uh, he writes, it's, it's, I think it's called, it's good to grow as a poor uh, 
as a poor child. So maybe we are also, we are all, we, we think, we, have, we cannot think like rich. So, so I see how maybe I somehow in my head, I can see some change, but yeah, but yeah. The summary is uh, that I, yeah. I'd love to have your email. I did send you a message on your, uh, I sent you a message on LinkedIn as well, just to make sure I don't lose you. <laughs> Because it would be nice okay. to bring you talk to our team and see together how we can do it. I'm from yeah, Isha. Yeah. Isha yeah, I love to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love to connect, and I, I believe that your experience will be very invaluable to us as you are in the, already at the field. And a lot of like by listening to what you said, there's just so many things I I could relate to. Like, if if you talk about like the theoretical or fundamental. Uh, aspects that you were just talking about, I, um, the the theoretical the theoretical uh, research direction um, I'm currently working towards, uh, I, I think it entails a pretty fundamental fundamental skepticism to the monetary system, uh, but uh, knowing that it is a constraint that we couldn't yet to overcome we still try to work within the constraints. And also by saying like, I could relate a lot to that you say uh, people have the, um, many people, they actually do have like the stereotype that democratic or alternative schooling is expensive. It's for rich people. And uh, that is another, that is also another part that's happening in Taiwan, which is that people seeing that experimental education is growing so fast, but um, uh, they, they have doubts whether that's going to be a new elitist education. And that's also a huge topic that we could probably further explore. And um, so by, by addressing the issue that a lot of um, alternative or the st addressing the stereotype of alternative education or, or democratic education being expensive or being like designated for the rich. Uh, I think there are few, few aspects of that. Um, I mentioned learning by contributing. And I also mentioned the case of Lydia uh, being a uh, children, being a child of a single parent, low income family. And so from her case, you can see that she, she builds her agency and she learns and builds her agency through providing value to what she cares. And by providing value to what she cares, to those, um, to those subjects that she cares, those subjects also, let me just go back to that. Uh, I'll just share that screen again. Hmm. Um, can you see the, um, can you see the screen again? Okay, I guess it's being screened right now. Okay, so basically, um, the idea of learning by contributing, it's about you all, it's based on the assumption that as long as a learner has a um, healthy enough upbringing, they will have the empathy and the care towards the world around them. And it might be the two different subjects. And so by- towards, I didn't hear what you, towards? Empathy towards? Uh, yeah, empathy and also they have care towards the world around them. Okay. As long as they, they have a um, sufficiently healthy upbringing um, but of course, like psychopaths, there might be some exceptions because they might have some unhealthy upbringings. So as long as they have, they have a sufficient healthy upbringing, they have uh, being empathetic and also being prosocial, uh, which is being verified by like positive psychology and also evolutionary psychology that it is our human nature. So <clears throat> we care about the world around us and there is, is this um, predisposition that we care others. So when we care others, we provide some value or we contribute to those that we care. And when they receive our care, 
um, whether they actually benefit from it. They give feedback to us. And those feedbacks, whether tangible or, tan or intangible, they become the new resources for learning, which could be like uh, feedbacks on how well did you do or what are some places for improvement That is one resource. And some other resources intangibly, for example, like the social, the social capital that you build through that connection. And of course, a lot of, there's a lot of literature in sociology and also maybe soci sociology of education about how social capital is related to agency. And so social capital, uh, the networks, the connections you build, and of course, there also might be some tangible rewards, for example, material rewards or like monetary rewards. So this is one, one way of working within the constraint of uh, the monetary system if we can't change it yet. So Lydia's example is one. And I see this as a model of kind of uh, building upon the philosophical foundations of critical pedagogy that I could move towards uh, through a more um, like, hmm. it could move towards an, agent, uh, an education that it's not only democratic, but also builds, uh, builds the learner's agency. And this idea of agency or this idea of learning by contributing is highly related to the idea I just shared, allocation dependence. Um, in education, um, most, of, most of the cases in education is that people build their agency, not through the process of their learning, but through credentials. So in order to gain credentials, they have to, they have to mold themselves into those modes. Uh, so they are, they are dependent to the allocation of credentials or other educational resources. And as long as that dependence exists, that molding, whether it's external or in internal, will always exist. And the way I see to go around it is through building agency from the individual level, which learning by contributing is a way to do that. So going like having the student being more um, interdependent or self reliant or self-sustainable, borrowing the idea of from sustainability here as well. So I, I think this, this might be some, um, I, I hope that this could provide some mm, health or information to your case in your village, because I see that this is, and, this and is yeah, with hundred villages. Yeah, yeah, and that's what, based on this idea, and that's also what we're trying to implement in the rural places in Taiwan as well. Cool. Thank you. Do Derry has something to say? Derry, unmute your mic, Derry. Yeah, I said all the rude words again, but fortunately you didn't hear them. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I love listening to Chaim talk. I, 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 I always think of Chaim as, a, I call him Mr. Tree, because usually he doesn't have his name on the screen. Usually it says, plant a tree, um, which is rather lovely. But on the question of funding, you know, um, it's a cultural thing, this. I don't accept at all that democratic education is expensive. If you look at the, the fees charged by Ian's College for Self-Managed Learning, for example, or Summerhill, if you take out the residential costs, the fees are actually less, I would guess, than are allocated per child to the state school. So what we have yeah. to find a way of doing is providing that funding um, without control. It's got to be done in a way that says we trust you to use this and we're going to learn from you, apart from obviously the basic child protection aspects of control. And 
I found when I was vice principal of a school, we tried to make it a community school. We tried to introduce the 20% self-directed learning that I talk about a lot these days. It was actually cheap because you started to draw on the resources of the community. Just at Ian's place, the kids aren't in the school half the time or in the college, sorry, Ian, aren't in the college. So you actually reduce the costs. Um, and I think we've got to, to sort of to kill this one that, um, that uh, uh, democratic education is expensive. It isn't because also within the school, the money you spend, what was it you called it? Allocation dependence. Yes, I really understand that concept. But the fact is, as your school resources relate more to the interests and needs of the kids, you get the resources right and you don't waste money. So I'm challenging the notion that democratic education is expensive, Mr. Tree, forgive me. Can I, can I come in and follow that? Because um, having mentioned this, um, yeah, the, the, nationally, the cost of, of uh, secondary education per pupil is, is £6,000 and it costs us to run the college £4,000 a year and that's including being a small place. Uh, when an independent researcher did research on ex-students and social class was included in that, and the only group that's not representative is actually the rich. We don't have any people from rich because they go to the private schools that are very expensive. If somebody, what we do though, is if somebody doesn't have any money, they don't pay anything. Um, so actually it's cheaper to come to us than the state school. Because if you go to the state school, the parents have to buy uniforms and pay all sorts of extras. Mm -hmm. They don't have any extras with us, including they get free food um, uh, in the college. Um, so they don't have to get a breakfast at home if they don't have a breakfast. Because we have a local trust that, that raises the money for those who don't have any money. Then the next level is parents who've got a bit of money but uh, you know on hard times so we have a hard sit fund and that would cover quite a lot and that's a friend of mine who is um, uh, a fairly rich guy um, and he puts in money into that and then if people can afford the four thousand they pay that um, but that is about equivalent to what the private schools would charge uh, for per term uh, and we charge that for a year but only for those parents who are if you like the middle class who got some money um, and we don't attract any rich kids whatsoever, which we're disappointed at because we'd like a more mixed group. So I just want to, excuse me one second, I just yeah. want to say. Sure, so sure. first of all, uh, our, uh, let's go to the cost of the government in the UK, what, for example, and then we'll talk about our cost. Uh, you also have somebody who donates money. Without donation, you cannot, we cannot keep the schools, so do you because the food is donation and the clothes in our case is donation. You talk about 4,000 pounds a year, yeah? 4,000 pounds. Yeah. Our cost is $300 a year per student for everything, food, clothes, education, everything. Uh, and of course, uh, I understand that if I do uh, the students study more alone, uh, like peer learning, we save teachers. So I, when you do peer, 30% of our education because of our concept is peer learning. And over there, we have, we have uh, let's say student teachers that are supporting, like mentoring in the, in the group. Uh, but uh, but you, you can use, you can have less teachers which are costly. Uh, even for us, the teachers are the biggest expense. I mean, we don't have fancy buildings, whatever. But teachers are still, if you want good teachers and not just somebody, uh, you know, we want them and then we, we mentor them for a year at least, so it's costly. But uh, that's the cost. The government cost is based on all the bureaucratic costs as well. So when they say 4,000, 2,000 is the offices of the government, not what they give. It's not the pure cost. If you look at the pure cost, how much is given to a child, to a student, it's maybe half of it, maybe less. The cost is all the management of the government offices. They come, you know, five people come to each school to count if you write correctly the book of the presence of the children. Just uh, Veda mentioned yesterday, they are coming to check the all kind of things in the school. So everything, if you cut down the bureaucracy from the government, if you do blockchain system to control all of it, let's say, I don't mind if they, 
they control because we still also, we want the children to be in a certain time in school. Uh, we had a school in Israel I'm involved. Also, there was an argument two weeks ago. Some parents said, we don't want to come and, you know, you have to come in a certain time. Democracy, a, a democratic school is not a, 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 a anarchy. You know, it's still, it's got some structure. The child they take some responsibility on himself. When he takes the responsibility, he needs to do it. We are not talking about anarchy. So, so the, the, we can find another way the, to manage the government side of mentoring, making sure the, the well-being of the children somehow, but not with such costs. And this cost can go to education. That's government budget. That's one thing that, of course, as we all know, it's uh, very exaggerated. Uh, and for us, yes, I know we can, we can, uh, we can buy democratic, but it's not, that's not what's presented. If you talk about, I don't want to mention schools, but I, we looked at, I, I actually looked at the cost of some of these schools. I can have a, a, new, a new class built every year for each student there in India, obviously. Our, it's not different cost. So uh, yes, we can, uh, we can reduce the cost and we can uh, use the money for other resources, of course, we can give more. For example, we want to have a room of art that students, if they don't feel good, they can just go and do what they want to do. Simple thing, yeah? But this is co costly. You need the, the materials are costly. If you want to do a activity, somebody offered yesterday, I forgot the name, that the children have a, a one hour free community activity with a open free arts and crafts material. It's all, big money because when children, the kids go alone, you know, they pour some more paint, they use some more paper. It's all cost, you know, one piece of paper, a cardboard, 50 by 76 rupee. I mean, it's a pound, a, a dollar, I think almost one piece of paper. So, you know, the, everything we are, the, there is a big, the, it's a, a, if you earn $2 a day, we need to think about the what level of cost of income is the, the family coming from. So we are dealing with people, they were two dollars a day already, that was already kind of stability, now it's down. I mean, we deliver food to the houses of the students now, and our burden is that I, I cannot send somebody with food for the child to studies by my school, where the families, the whole family doesn't have food. So we need to supply food for the whole household. So this, during this period, we, a lot of our endowment, we used to give food and this is number one. I mean, if they don't have food, what's the point in education? Yeah, yeah. I think, I think in this good. regard, I, I, in this regard, I would also like to add something. Uh, my personal experience here in Nepal also, I think it depends on the context, you see, uh, because resources in Western, like Europe and America, resources are already there. It's all about managing. It's all, all about that, you know. But here in the context of Nepal and India, it's, it's really about resources. We do not have resources. For example, let's say it's much easier to have 20, 30 students or 40, 50 students in a classroom. A teacher comes, delivers a lecture and goes. It's, it's cost efficient. But if we want to introduce democratic way of learning or self-directed learning, then you have to take students out of the classroom. So to handle 50 students or handle in the sense to take care of 50 students, if you are going to take them out, you need at least, you have to hire a few more. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. You can hear me now? We can't. Yeah. So, we so couldn't I, hear you also. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's a very context oriented kind of, uh, uh, what do what do I say regarding the cost? You know, like if like uh, what Ian was saying, I think I'm sure it's uh, it really makes sense when you talk about uh, the cost efficiency in Europe about democratic education. But when it comes to Nepal and India, the the whole ball game is different. We we do not have resources at all. I mean, like uh, like Chaim was saying, we have for every paper we for every a4 sheet we have to pay money we have to get it somewhere we have to depend on someone for every activity we have to get something you know so, so it's really a context oriented kind of thing so dem introducing democratic way of learning in the context of nepal and india for <laughs> sure is much more costly at the at this point of time where where the family they are not able to afford for let's say a 
an extra box of pencil or an extra box of colors and so on. So, so I think we are living in the moment in terms of democratic education as well. Yeah, I think my comment was a bit culturally arrogant. So I, I apologize for that. But within our context, I think it's important, um, it, it's important to not allow the democratic education movement to be accused of being elitist or expensive because the resources are available here. It's just that they're not challenged in the best way, they're not channeled in the best way. And control always comes very shortly after the allocation of resources unless we have a much more administrative way of sharing the resources. Um, so apologies for that, Vida. Yeah, I, I, I allow, I, I, I've I learned from what you and Kaim have said, and it's important. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Also in Israel, for example, I'm involved in a few, in two democratic schools, one of them in a poor area. So they took a, a, a school in a very poor area, it was kind of failing, I don't know how to say, and the, uh, the, the first two years are already democratic, and we work also with the, the teachers and the team is working also. Nobody was sent away, all the teachers are kept and they're being retrained and whatever. And, uh, and uh, we, we found out that without donations, uh, that's how I'm connected, they come to me because I'm expert in collecting money, my head is big in collection. So, uh, so uh, they, they couldn't, uh, without donations, they couldn't manage without getting money because, you know, we needed uh, like all kinds, we're not going to details, but whatever we needed, we needed to collect because the budget frame from the government is very strict. That's what you get for this group, a age group, yeah? And even though we have special aid, whatever we had special aid, you can, they, they, they don't care. They have a fixed cost. So now, uh, we are playing around with a donation until we will come to a stage when they grow a little bit, a bit older and they can do things by themselves and all of that. And we'll bring, like I agree with the students is uh, one thing and also community based in India, what we do now, there is some law that uh, the companies have to give something to society. I'm not sure how it works, but what we do, so instead of getting donations, and they need to give, so they, they are make, making all our, what we need from cardboard and papers and all kind of work, they are doing for now for online. The, the people from companies pre prepare for us, which is nice because interactivity between uh, our teams and, uh, and companies, uh, so we get such kind of a uh, way, that's how we get all kind of materials we need and some work that we need to do, they do for us. Yeah, like time. Uh, I think it's a big discussion. I think we should continue sometime for sure, you know, because uh, it's a it's an important part of the whole discussion that's going around uh, for the past 15 days. Uh, but we have to move on. We have another session coming up. So, okay. so yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. You talk from the heart, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. I think we should continue for sure about this thing. You know, it's important that all of us realize that we are working in two different or three, four different worlds, you know, all together. Uh, and how we can uh, how we can bring these things together and unite everyone. So, uh, Adler, you have your last words. Thank you very much. Yeah, you know, say, say something, and uh, we'll finish this session. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really enjoyed this conversation, and especially the comments are just so invaluable, especially from each of your contexts. And I think. Uh, the questions and comments that you raise are very important, and that is very relevant to the theoretical research direction I'm working towards. And some of, so currently I have three working theses that are related to this. And my, my basic, my current assumption is that as long as humans are dependent on allocation, dependent on monetary, system and de dependent even more radically dependent on rationality there will be inequality or poverty and um the 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 issues that uh chang and veda raised like when you are when you are dependent on like like you mentioned like crayons right like when you you when you need when you when the society 
created that need for these like uh, products produced by the so-called civilized, then um, yeah, there there always will be that gap. And but it's just just so fundamental. But I still would like to go deeper towards that direction, and we'll love to have more of your like real experiences. Thank you. Thank so, you. So Thank you for Thank you. a wonderful talk. Thank you so Thank much. You. Uh, let's keep in touch mm -hmm. and uh, hope to see you in Nepal soon also amongst us. Yeah, Thank you.